of you speaking what you feel shame about is an anti-shame behavior. It's a it's an anecdote in some ways to the shame spiral because what you're saying when you do that is, I don't have anything to hide from. I don't need to hide from this. This is not a fatal flaw. This is not saying something about me definitively as a person. Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Dr. Beck. And I am Christine Barker. And this is Am I Doing It Wrong? A podcast for doctors by doctors. Dr. Beck is a mindset coach and medical doctor who specializes in liberating driven professional women from the limitations of perfectionism, imposter syndrome, and people pleasing. She's basically the cheat code for getting out of your own way, showing up authentically, and living a life you're proud of. And Christine is a medical educator and nephrologist who creates resources for doctors in training that I truly think are an unfair advantage. She makes complex topics super simple and takes the pain and uncertainty out of passing your medical exams. Christine and I connected a few years ago via our online platforms and over the years we've discussed countless highs, lows and in-betweens of doctor life and in doing so we've experienced firsthand the power of vulnerable conversations to show us where we get in our own way and underestimating our capacity. So we want you to be part of the conversation and experience these same results. Every week on the pod, we'll be bringing you conversations which shine light in dark places, normalize the doctor journey, ease unnecessary suffering, and give you actionable steps to thrive in all facets of your life. So grab a cuppa and get cozy for this week's episode of Am I Doing It Wrong? The podcast for doctors by doctors. Hello, everybody. We are on the, I was going to say the highest high, but it feels more honored. I feel honored after uh, this, this beautiful comment that one of our listeners has shared with us. And we just wanted to shout you out to start with Linda Shelley Smith. Firstly, we're just so, so grateful to hear from you. Christy and I, hope that you know this from the bottom of our hearts. We want to hear from you. We're only doing this podcast as long as you guys tell us that it's useful for you. And we're so, so grateful that it has been useful for you. Um, but it's it's just even more meaningful to have people take the time to connect with us and tell us that. We know that by definition, you guys are really, really busy. I mean, how does it <laughs> what does it mean to you, Christine? Oh my goodness. I just cannot wait for you to share this um, with the audience because I guess what Beck is about to share um, from Linda Shelley Smith, or new peep, um, it, it just shows me that uh, there's more people out there who have a similar train of thought to us. And, and I'm seeing this all the time in my environment. When I was going through my training, I just felt like I was on an island by myself and I felt like I was the only person with any kind of struggle and the only person who was having all these experiences. And what I'm seeing now as I bump into people in my real life who are listening to the podcast and who are resonating is that there's this beautiful domino effect where everyone that I'm coming across is... I guess shining light in dark places themselves. They are opening conversations. So we're we're just sitting here doing what we do and we're trying to um share our experiences with you in the hope that it will help. But then what I'm seeing is a tribe of people who are like-minded. And I think it's just such a beautiful ripple effect in the world. And I feel like Linda Shelley Smith <laughs> is this ripple effect. So um all Let's share with the audience, Cameron. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Linda gets it. <laughs> so Linda has used her own insane artistic abilities to write this poem. So she wrote to us, loving your message and your podcast, thinking about it, this poem came to me. Sit back and enjoy, guys. And this is highly relevant to our episode today. Linda's written, and I was asked, are you sure? Have you thought about the ways you could be cut short? Aren't you scared of failing hard in full view of all the world? Such a lovely dream, it's true. But can it be done by you? If I were you, I'd think again. Be sensible. Be more zen. 
And my answer from my heart, now this is the most important part. Well, if I don't or if I do, to my own self, I must be true. We're all just here until we die. So for now, at least I'll try. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's the second time I've read that in the last two minutes and it, oh, it still just moves me. It's not wearing off. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Also, can I point out that like, Linda, if you ever need anyone to read a poem, I feel like Beck's your woman, <laughs> apart from yourself, obviously, but you're good at reading stuff like that. I don't know. I was quite moved by your narration. <laughs> if you ever don't want to be a thought wizard, you can go to Audible and read books. <laughs> but I'll listen. <laughs> I was actually thinking, I really, really want to do it justice. It's just, it's so moving, isn't it? I love, I love she started off with all those you know, she's talking about how we, and I, I, I'm i sorry if I have, if I twist the meaning of this or misinterpret it, Linda, but I'll just talk about what I kind of have taken from that. And it, you're talking about how, you know, we decide to do these challenging or just different or new things in our lives. And as we do that, or is it even just being ourselves, which in itself is a new thing, we step into that. And as we do, inevitably, those people show up uninvited and they will tell us why we can't or why we shouldn't. And they might be well-intended. They might, they might not be. But as you've said, you've come around to what actually matters to you. And you're saying regardless of whether you fail or not, regardless of whether they're right or not, you would rather have tried in this one life. And, oh, I just, I, I want to live my life that way. And I feel like the people who listen to our podcast want to live their life that way. You don't choose to listen to content like this if you're happy to just, to just go along the ride and not live in your integrity. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's so relevant to what we have to chat about today. So today, <laughs> Beck and I are talking about shame. Shame, spiraling, shame. Ugh, shame. <laughs> Before we do that, though, um, we do have to remind you that we have the How Dare You Darling Party coming up at the end of next week. So if you want to get on the list to that, you want to come to that, just click the link below. It is free and we would love to see you there. Um, But yeah, so we decided to talk about shame today because very recently I had a shame spiral. And so whilst it was fresh, I thought it was super useful to (laughs) conjure up those feelings, sit with those feelings with you guys, because I think this is so common in our lives generally, but also in our lives as doctors. If you're doing hard things, if you're in a public forum, if you are a doctor who has the risk of making a medical mistake, for example, if you're in any way judged by anyone at any time, your peers, your colleagues, just living this life we live as doctors, I think this is this comes up for um, so many of us. So very recently, I was in a shame spiral. And I feel like the example of the shame spiral, the reason that I got the shame spiral, I'm not going to share <laughs> too many details today. Um, but I can remember a really uh, funny example from my distant past that I feel a bit more game to talk about today. So um, I'm going to tell you that wee story um, just really to amuse you and <laughs> see if you can relate to the shame spiral. But what we want to do today is sort of talk about how it actually is when you're in the middle of a shame spiral and how to get yourself out. And of course, um, Beck is the queen of helping us in these situations. So an example of a past shame spiral I had was, as you know, I'm a medical educator. And way back, it was many years ago now, I had a new spangly iPad. And I was so excited about this because I had my Apple pen and then I could write things down and I was I could also do whiteboard shoots, right? So I was trying it out. And I had this whiteboard too at work. So this was like my work colleagues and it was like, you know, the renal team, <laughs> the people who know me, work with me all the time. Oh my goodness. I can't believe this happened to me still. 
And I'm using my new iPad to give a whiteboard to. But in the same place, I had downloaded like Good Notes, and I had my little my little window open for my whiteboard shoot. And at the same time, I also had the window open for a new notebook that I had created, which was now my journal. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. So, for those of you who journal, you will know that journaling is sometimes just a case of like kind of emptying your head, just like allowing a stream of consciousness to come out. It doesn't necessarily mean very much at all, but if someone was to read your journal, you could come across as quite psychotic in some way, <laughs> like there's something very wrong with you. And I think at the time this happened, and I kid you not, Beck, it was like I was journaling about my white privilege or something like that. I was very conscious of that. And I was thinking about how privileged I was in a gratitude way, but also acknowledging the privilege I've get been gifted in this world, that kind of thing, which this was my journal entry of the day. <laughs> And I had sort of, I had this whiteboard shoot set up, but I stepped away for a moment and I thought I still had it on my whiteboard. No, 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 no. I had it on my journal page, my handwritten wee journal page. <laughs> and I had it there for several minutes so everyone could read my thoughts. Okay, so on set, the shame spiral, right? <laughs> I've now been publicly humiliated. Everyone knows I'm off chops in my journal and I'm just like, I will never live this down. How can I go back to work, right? That's how I was feeling. And so I, what I think is really interesting about the shame spiral, and if you've had one recently, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a very dark emotion. So although that's a funny example, when we're in that space, it can feel like, you'll never be normal again. Like you feel so ashamed and so embarrassed and so disappointed in yourself. And whatever's happened has happened. And it's now in the past and you can't go back in time and change it no matter how much you want to. And so it's done and you have to live with it, whatever it is. And then you have this horrible it's just a really horrible feeling. I want to, when I'm feeling shame, it's the same as when I feel guilt. I want to run away from it. I don't want to sit with it. I don't want it in my body. I want to leave it alone. And I also feel like I'll never be normal again. And my recent shame spiral was approximately yesterday. So I can tell you today I do feel better. So if you are in a shame spiral, believe me when I say it will end. I promise I promise you that. Um, especially if you have Dr. Beck in your atmosphere. She's really good at this. Um, but yeah, so I feel I feel like it's such a dark emotion and it, there's such a feeling of wanting to escape from it. And I actually reached out to Beck yesterday in the middle of one of my shame spirals. To, and it was this, um, I'd love to unpack it with you because Beck unpacked it for me yesterday and I'd love you to, to share it with the audience today. Is this kind of, I was saying to Beck, I don't want to sit down and try and process this right now because I think I'm going to end up in a shame spiral of no return. Like it's going to feel worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And normally with other emotions, I would maybe sit and try and process something, maybe have a wee cry. But with this, it was like, it's too big. I did not want to go near it. Um, and Beck sort of put me back on track. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to stop talking now. And I really love you to take it from there, Beck. Can you explain how you approach this situation when you're helping someone like me who's in the middle of a hideous shame spiral? <laughs> yeah. And firstly, can I just put my hands up and say, me too. And uh, let me bring a medical example, a clinical example to you guys that will probably make your gut sink as well. This, oh, it makes me, it still, it feels, it doesn't grab me, but it still feels uh, heavy when I think about it. So one example, just one example in my clinical life where I felt guilt and shame, you know, that and the kind of cocktail of all the other emotional stack that comes with it, the inadequacy and the um, incompetence and the feeling exposed and vulnerable, you know, shame is often not just that emotion. It's of often a track for these other really difficult emotions. But I think about the time when I was an oncology register for the first time and I gave a patient who did not have sufficient neutrophils, their chemotherapy. This was the end of my registrar round. I was rounding and it was getting towards, um, it was, he was one of the last patients on our round. And um, 
I think I made a few mental shortcuts that led to this happening where I assumed that by lunchtime, by this time of the day, the bloods would be back. You know, that I could look at the blood test, that I could pull it up on the computer and what I see, like if I don't see any, in retrospect, when I was looking back at this, I think what happened was I was like, if there's no abnormality, if there's no red highlight there on the blood panel, we're good to go. I can be like, tick, give the chemotherapy. And instead, what happened was, well, I looked at the blood panel using that, that rule of thumb and I was like, no red, good to go. But actually, the reality was all of the other test results were back in that hematology tube, or most of them at least, and the neutrophils weren't back yet. So I actually gave the chemotherapy, I gave the okay to give the chemotherapy when I didn't have a neutrophil result for the last 24 hours yet. And I mean... (laughs) There's, there's lots of different angles we could talk about this with, you know, in terms of if mistakes like that are grabbing you too, this is a really good example of, you know, part of what I learned in that process was, yes, it was my job to give the correct treatment to the correct patient in the correct context. Of course, that's my job. And also as a part of the protocol for the nurses, they're also Um, to check the neutrophils as well so again it's a bit of a Swiss cheese model you can also see how you know it 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 was fair enough for me to think that um, it would be more obvious if a test result wasn't back that I'd use that shortcut to be like if there's no abnormality good to give it Um, and perhaps we could approve the system in that way but also I've learned from that now, I've learned that I can't trust shortcuts like that. I need to lay my eyes on these specific numbers, which it might seem obvious, but to me, it was a learning point. It was something that I didn't know. And, you know, the, the ultimate part of the, what made the situation okay was this patient thankfully wasn't harmed by this mistake that I had made I'd made a mistake here and the patient wasn't harmed not everyone is so lucky with their mistakes and I certainly have made mistakes that have harmed the patient a patient to a certain extent even in my registrar roles or resident roles or intern roles or probably even as a med student you know I I had the capability to do that and I I just want to highlight that I just want to bring a, a very vulnerable honest example of when I have made an actual mistake and naturally and I was younger then as well, and I was it, this was several years ago, but I did definitely go into a shame spiral. It affected me for more than just a moment, for more than just a day, if, but for many days and for the rest of my oncology term, probably into my next term, and it still has some impact on me now when I think about that. I think about how um, the things that I do can cause harm like that and it makes me feel a bit on edge and it also makes me feel a bit of that shame and guilt again too so I'm I'm sure anybody listening here can think about times in their clinical life by the nature of our work by the nature of being imperfect humans even the fact that our minds aren't robotic our minds are imperfect we don't we don't perceive reality when we walk around the world and actually one of the first um studies I was reading that acknowledged this the study of perception versus reality was it was a psychologist I believe it might have been a neuroscientist and they were working out the gap between reality and our perception of reality and what they were doing was they were looking at a uh, a metronome I think it was or one of those devices where the beads move and they were tracking when the bead actually moved versus when we perceived the bead to move. So all of that to say, you know, there's, there's even a difference from what we perceive in something so, so simple as an object moving in space. There's a difference to the reality of the object moving in space versus our perception of it. So we're just working with our minds, which are imperfect tools to move us around the world. So all of this to say, we really want to focus this episode on the 
the commonality that we all have of having these frequent exposures to experiences that can cause us significant shame as clinicians. Unfortunately, we do jobs where we will be exposed to these potentially shame-inducing situations probably more frequently than most other professions, dare I say. And so if we can do this work today, if we can help you today in even the smallest way with your shame spirals, we hope that we are going to make your, well, we know that we are going to make your clinical lives so much better. So with all that being said, let me now circle back to your question, Christine. (laughs) Can you remember what it was before I went on my little storytelling time there? (laughs) Well, no, I love that. And thank you for being so vulnerable because I can fully relate to um, that experience as well of medical mishaps, but I think it's still so vulnerable to share. So thank you so much for that. And like you like you say, everyone listening will have an example of that. It's just unavoidable in the sort of the arena that we're in. But yeah, my, my uh, it wasn't really a question. It was more of a like, how did you help me yesterday? Because you you gave this beautiful thing yesterday where we talked about the difference between a shame spiral and like this um, actually just being able to process the experience and they're like two different things. <laughs> and I was like, that was such an aha moment for me. Can you start there and tell us the difference between them and then how, how do you get out of one or the other? Yeah, totally. <laughs> And I remember you yesterday being in the like, this space that I can totally empathize with, which is I just don't feel like, I feel like if I lean into this feeling, if I lean into the reality of my current experience, my current situ- situation, I'm only going to feel worse. I'm just going to become, I'm going to lose more and more control if I do that rather than end up feeling more in control. I'm going to maybe even lose further touch of reality and feel like I lose myself even more and disconnect from myself even more as opposed to what you're wanting to do, which was to meet your reality and be with yourself in your current experience as you do so well intuitively with your emotions so you can take care of yourself so that you can build that trust back up with yourself so you can get back out there in the world and do your thing again. The the adage... Well, that common phrase, it gets worse before it gets better, really applies here. And I think there are two different ways. One is feeling worse, but then you're on a pathway to actually ultimately feeling better. And the other one is the shame spiral, where you feel worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. (laughs) So that was the distinction um, that we wanted to talk about today. How do you know if what you're doing, if it feels worse at the start anyway, how do you know if what you're doing is actually being productive and leading to you feeling better or even just not avoiding yourself, not resisting yourself, not breaking your trust with yourself, not abandoning yourself or something that is going to make you feel worse? So there are two different, um, these two different directions that, that Christine alluded to. One, I call the shame spiral but I know I didn't come up with that term. I think that's a very well-known term for a very commonly experienced phenomenon. And something that, well, and the second way is getting to the shame source. So firstly, the shame spiral. I think the way that I describe the shame spiral in terms of what's actually happening in your experience is quite unique. When I talk about a shame spiral, For me, what it really means is that we're stacking stories. So it's when you have that initial experience of shame and with that you add different meaning to mm, the story that's in your head about the shame or you're adding new or extra evidence for why you should feel shame. So it's, it's that you find the, the initial story, which is I've done something wrong and that creates shame in you. And the shame stop spiral, you stack another story on top. So you're like adding meaning and that means I'm a bad person or that means I'm a bad doctor. Let's make that the next layer. 
And then, so you've stacked one book. I've done something wrong. You've stacked another book. I've done, I'm, I'm not a good doctor. And then another loop in the spiral, you stack another book. And that means I'm a bad person. Another book. And that means I shouldn't be doing this job. And that means I should have never been doing this job. It was so irresponsible for me to ever be doing this job. And stack, 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 heavier, 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 heavier becomes your shame. Because now it's not just one source of shame. You're stacking stories. You're stacking other sources of shame. And down the spiral we go. It's that sensation of increasing heaviness, increasing shame, and overwhelm, this sort of stacking of overwhelm, becoming almost overwhelmed and paralyzed in that overwhelm with all those thoughts of shame to the point where, you know, you were saying you had that, that experience, Christine, that I really relate to when you just feel like I'm, I'm, I'm stuck like this. I could never, I can never get out of this. There's just too much evidence for why I should feel shame. There are too many reasons. And this, we might even just stop there and check in with if that resonates with you in terms of a shame spiral and what you experience yourself or if there's anything you wanted to add. Oh, 100%. I just knew I couldn't go near it, but you gave me the language for it, which I thought was really interesting and really why I wanted to talk about it today because I just knew that I did not want to continue to experience this emotion. And what I did instead, actually, which was I realized is a coping strategy of mine, is I went to the shops, not for retail therapy, but I do something very particular at the shops, which is I love to go to those little, like a candle shop or a perfume shop or something where there's something to... (laughs) <laughs> sniff <laughs> and I'll go and I'll literally like sniff candles or something and what I realized is that I find that so joyful because it's mindful like it takes me into the present moment and I'm no longer thinking about what just happened in the past or how that is going to impact my future and the fact that I no longer want to have whatever just happened to me in my future again <laughs> career change pending and it just took me right into the moment and then I just I felt better so I I actually after it I was like oh I think I was doing mindfulness there like going to the shops is actually mindfulness all right Christine you do like mindfulness because I I I don't identify as being a mindful person anyway that's a bit of a tangent so just to say that I could not tolerate being with myself so I went to the shops and had this sensory experience (laughs) to run away from myself and I remember saying this to you I was like Beck I know that there's something wrong with me and I need to sit and process it, but I don't want to. It's too dark. It's too dark. And then I (laughs) went off and um, you had left me this voice message when I was out at the shops and it was talking about this, yeah, how the the shame spiral is a stack. And then I could totally see how I was doing that. I was doing that thing where I was like, if I sit down with this right now, I will consolidate the belief that I should never show up in public again. Yeah. (laughs) Which is not compatible with my life. And thank you so much for giving us all permission to go shopping. Shopping is mindfulness, guys. Quote Dr. Christine Barker. Go buy some candles. Don't even buy them. Just snap them. Really annoy the sales assistant yet. (laughs) So I don't. We really, you know, there. and like you're saying, what you did was so productive in, in, it was just, it was a certain productive that there are, there's not one right way to deal with these situations and you still looked to yourself and you were like what do I need and you were in a fragile place as I am when I feel shame too and just to be able to ask that question of yourself what do I need right now and you know being able to do an activity that like had you step out of that mindset of being in shame at the time it it does help to it, it does help to shop, stop the shame spiral if you don't feel like you're in control of it. If that's available to you, it's not always available to people to be able to even do mindfulness in that moment. So hats off to you for that skill. But it at least stops us from this other phenomenon called the mood congruent memory bias, which is when you're feeling an emotion, we will pull forwards memory. Our, our brains will highlight memories and pull forwards memories that are congruent with this emotion. It's like, oh, I'm feeling like you walk into the library of your mind and you're like, I'm feeling shame. What are all the books that I have about why I feel shame or why I should feel shame? And then you, you go to that section, but, but you're like sleepwalking. You can't stop your mind from doing that because you're just in that zombie-like shame st- spiral time. But that's kind of what happens with that emotion. You go, it's almost like a 
it is a form of confirmation bias. What we feel and what we're experiencing as our reality, our brain then finds evidence to back that up and support that. So stepping out and having a moment of mindfulness, it takes that bias away that would otherwise be working against you and would otherwise be pushing you towards that shame spiral. So I think it was really intuitively skillful what you did there. And as we're alluding to, there's kind of this flip side. So we've talked about the shame spiral and how that's stacking those those books about why you should feel shame and giving you more and more evidence, just paper after paper after paper, stacking, feeling heavier, just feeling more and more overwhelmed. And then there's the way that it feels worse on the way to feeling better. And to me, I call that going to the shame source or in other words, meeting the reality of your shame experience. Now, I'm careful with the word reality here because people think that when I say reality, I'm talking about some objective external environmental reality, like that Christine has some factual reason to, to feel shame. But I'm talking about the reality of her internal experience. That is her reality as well. What is going on in her mind and in her body? And this is another way that we can deal with shame that, yes, feels worse at first, but it's on the way to feeling better. And it's really going to understand why am I feeling shame right now? And we might find that, you know, if, probably very obvious in Christine's mind in one sentence why she was feeling shame in that moment. She was like, I did X wrong, for example. I actually don't know what was, sorry, Christine's referring to in that old example, but like something simple, I, I did X wrong. And we can easily believe that that's the reason that we're feeling shame. But actually it's those other thoughts that you're not aware of yet. You know, you can have ideas and thoughts in your mind that you haven't recognized as thoughts yet. And only when you go and sit with yourself for a minute, only when you go and you give yourself a minute to slow your mind down and truly ask, why am I feeling shame? Where is the shame coming from? What is this shame trying to tell me? What is the purpose of the shame? What is the perceived payoff of this shame? These questions that help you understand why is my body producing a shame experience? When you do that, when you bring these thoughts that you weren't aware of up into your mind that are probably going to be the darker thoughts that weren't just, I did X wrong. But for me, it's going to be thoughts like, take me back to that oncology example. You know, the thoughts that are like, really, you shouldn't be a doctor. You were so lazy to not look. The least you could have done for this person's health wellness, morbidity, mortality, the least you could do is take a minute to lay your eyes on the neutrophils. That's the least you could do. How careless of you to not do that. All of these extremely painful, critical thoughts. It's those thoughts that were causing me the shame. It wasn't the superficial thought of, oh, I've done something wrong. It was there was much, much more underneath. And it was just swirling around like a big storm that I couldn't quite catch. I couldn't quite see. The clouds were too dark. I couldn't see what was actually happening there. And I didn't want to either. Just like your experience, Christine, I didn't want to look at all that stuff. The shame I was feeling already felt unbearable. I was already struggling to control myself. I remember the tears just flowed when I realized what I'd done. I was so upset. And I couldn't cope with, you know, I was at work. I couldn't cope with letting go of any more control or the the potential for me to let go of any more control by feeling even more overwhelmed by the shame I was feeling. But, and while that professional setting wasn't the place for me to go and find the source of my shame, that was work that I needed to do. Otherwise, that shame wasn't going anywhere. You know, to have thoughts like that in my mind and not address them, either because I thought, oh, no, you're just overreacting or everybody makes mistakes. You know, if I tried to give some throwaway thoughts and dismiss those thoughts, that would just keep rumbling away. This this thunderstorm sort of waiting to erupt in me and you, you, you 
bet the next time I was to make any mistake, it would just erupt again. So going to the shame source and deciding, so firstly seeing what really is the cause of my shame, overreactions included, misinterpretations included, errors in your thinking included. You got to bring all that stuff in. You've got to meet the reality of what your mind is offering you right now. Then once you see all of that, once you can see that clearly, then the next step is for you to decide what am I going to think on purpose about this? What do I actually think about this? You know, I always say that, you know, I think about 80% of the thoughts, at least in my mind, are absolute nonsense. Like they, they, they just do not resonate with me. They're not in my integrity. They're not who I, who I am. You know, if I had somebody, um, you know, show my journaling, my stream of thoughts like you, Christine, like in public, I would be mortified because I'd be like, I don't actually think any of that stuff, guys. <laughs> it's just thoughts that my brain is producing. <laughs> I can't control it. There's a big difference <laughs> between what your brain automatically thinks and what you think when you have your awareness and your reasoning and your integrity and your values and what you choose to actually action on on purpose. So for me, it was a process of first, you know, this brought up all these thoughts that I've never had to deal with before, like making such a big mistake in my mind like that, to make such a big mistake. This brought up all these thoughts about me as a doctor, as a person that I'd never had to deal with before. And so it took a little bit of time for me to unravel that. And then I had to also decide how I was going to respond. But there was no point deciding in how I was going to respond and what I actually thought before I'd seen the actual source of the problem, before I'd gone gone to the shame source. But you can see how creating that clarity, meeting that reality of your mind, your experience, actually addresses the source of the shame. And I was talking about this with a client um, the other day. We were talking about how she used to be very critical of herself and she's gone through, we we were doing a a celebration call at the end and she'd gone through six months and she was talking about how, you know, she used to just do that thing where she dismissed these concerns and criticisms and stuff and she'd be like, you know, somebody would say something to her and she'd be like hurt by it and then after, you know, three to five days, you kind of forget about it if you're lucky. But then the next time it comes up, it grabs you again because you haven't actually dealt with it. You've just distracted yourself from it. Whereas for me, and this is the same for her, now she's like, now that I actually understand how to go to the source and meet the reality, and I'm actually willing to see the reality of what's going on in my experience, and then I have enough connection with my integrity to address those things and decide what I think on purpose. When you do that, the next time it comes up, it doesn't control you again. And I admittedly still have residual, a bit of a residual grab about the neutrophil thing. And I think that's just me being aware of my power to harm patients, my accidental power to harm patients. The fact that when I walk into this job, it makes me feel unsafe that I can harm people. And I'm okay with that. I I haven't found a way to reconcile that, that just always feels peaceful at the moment. But because I can face the source, it doesn't control me like it did in that first week where I don't break it down into tears or want to leave medicine because of it. So I've said a lot (laughs) here, but this is something that's so, so important to me. And I even just posted a reel the other day um, similar to this, guys, where I just... I found myself on the floor and I was like, this is a perfect example, uh, opportunity to show people that you never, ever arrive anywhere perfect. And I was just feeling, I think my feelings were kind of similar to shame. I was feeling insecure and afraid. And I I just took a moment to go to the source. Um, and I hope that when you guys have these shame experiences in the future, which you inevitably will in your clinical work, oh my goodness, I hope that you can be kind to yourself, be willing to see the humanity of your shame experience instead of making it harder for yourself by doing the story stack, 
being in the shame spiral, making it heavier and heavier for yourself. Yeah, I love everything you said. And as you were talking, I sort of realized as well how, yes, the the shame spiral. And then what you said about kind of when you're in that, you called it a shame experience that your body's giving you. And you kind of go through, you'll go and find all this evidence as to why you should feel shame. And as you were saying that, I think I realized that when I have these experiences, I definitely call up, I must have so many unprocessed events. And I'm talking about from school and childhood and every time that I was exposed in some way or got the wrong answer or just did something in public that just embarrassed me, like to to sort of layer onto that journaling example, it feels like it wasn't just that shame spiral I was in. It was the many, many, many shame spirals before. And so it's it's sort of powerful what you're saying in terms of if you're able to, at some stage, go and meet your experience and actually process what happened. And the other thing I obviously found really useful yesterday, like I know that you are an absolute thought wizard and I feel so privileged to be in your sphere, but I feel like I've also had experiences where I've been in a shame spiral and I have contacted um even someone like just another colleague from work that I trust and sort of talked things over. I think your shame is also very powerful as well because it helps you to sort out what you're saying, like what's real and what's not real. And and they can kind of mirror back to you, like, you know, do you really believe that? Or like, you know, are the, they'll sort of, the, there's usually a soothing that comes from having shared one of these experiences because your perception of reality is so intense and it takes another person almost to come in and be like, okay, <laughs> actually what really happened? I think that can be useful, especially if you're very close to the, like going into a shame spiral. Whereas if you set yourself and try and process it, unless you've maybe done some thought work, like like you have Beck or maybe been to one of Beck's programs or something, then you might, you might just be at risk of always going into the shame spiral. So I, I feel so grateful to you for yesterday because you really got me back on track. And I think it's the real magic of what you do as as a coach as well it's I mean you weren't coaching me yesterday you were being my friend yesterday but you know you can't help but carry around all the skills you have (laughs) so um thank you so much but I I think there's so much magic in having someone else to help when you're in a shame spiral I could not agree more and you do the same thing for me and you know I hope you guys can take Christine's invitation there to reach out to a colleague do your best to make it someone that you trust and I think if you're not sure if you can trust them when it comes to shame I wouldn't take the risk I I would err on the side of then leaning towards someone professional for whom it's their job to observe thoughts rather than get caught up in the narrative a mental health professional a coach a mindset coach in particular but you know Take those opportunities to speak to your colleagues. You know, as we were trying to allude to clinicians, this is just part and parcel of our job. This is not something that we get to escape. This is, I mean, uh, I, even in the situation, in my situation, you know, I didn't harm the patient by pure luck because this person had enough reserve to tolerate the clinical mistake I made. But the situations, and, and still with that, it was so hard for me to process and the situations can be so much worse. And then we can bring in legal battles and things like that. And the, all the, the, the guiding, um, uh, the, the regulators and so on, all these extra forces that can make us feel even more and more and more shame, but it's, an experience, whether you're kind of on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of the amount of shame you feel or the amount of damage you did or the extent to which you were, you believe you were incompetent or made a mistake, um, all the way up to more extremes, our colleagues as clinicians can relate to you. So they've been somewhere on the spectrum. And so you have this beautiful resource of your other colleagues. And I think what Christine said about having somebody to help you tease out what is story and what is reality is so powerful if you're in that mind space to be able to do that. And I would encourage you to be really explicit as you go into these conversations with your colleagues with what you need. With saying, for example, I just need to talk this out. I just need to be heard. 
I don't want you to tell me if I'm right or wrong. I don't want you to give me advice or anything, but do you just have five minutes to listen to me? Do you just have 15 minutes to listen to me or, or whatever you want? Maybe you do want advice. Maybe you do want to be challenged, but go into those conversations being explicit because it's not easy to be on the receiving end. A lot of us are fixers. A lot of us want to fix the problems and use our logic and, and things like that. And if you can be explicit with what you need, you're the only one who knows what's going on with you and what you need at the time. So that's one thing. And I just want to add to what Christine said, speaking to somebody, even if they don't have much, say, skill to be able to um, have a particularly productive conversation, just the act of you speaking what you feel shame about is an anti-shame behavior. It's a, it's a anecdote in some ways to the shame spiral because what you're saying when you do that is, I don't have anything to hide from. I don't need to hide from this. This is not a fatal flaw. This is not saying something about me definitively as a person. And this is what Christine pointed out so um, with such great self-awareness at the start that it feels permanent at the time. It feels lasting. But when you speak your shame, you're doing the opposite of what shame is suggesting. And you're saying, no, I don't have anything to hide from here. Just the act of speaking your shame, I think is powerful in itself. So use your people, use your clinicians who are in this same crazy job that we're all doing. And actually in the next episode, we're going to talk about how... <laughs> abnormal this job is because I think we need to talk about it more don't we Chrissy definitely but oh that was another mic drop moment yeah speak speak your shame ah uh, it's an antidote to shame I, I'm, I'm butchering it but whatever you just said let's like broadcast that in every situation before we walk in at the hospital every day let's just have Beck on the tannoy that's what I'd like in my life <laughs> Thank you so much, Beck. And thank you to everyone who's listening. We're sending so much love to your past, present and future shame spirals. Feel free to send this episode to someone who you think will benefit. Um, we love to hear from you, just like Linda Shelley Smith. You don't have to write a poem, but we'd love to hear any suggestions. The for... standard is very high. <laughs> it's quite high now. But <laughs> thank you again, Linda. But hearing from you, it would just be lovely in any capacity and um, any questions, comments. We just would love to um, interact with you as much as possible. And of course, if you are free on the 12th of May, you're going to get your little name. Click the little link. We're going to be doing the party and we're going to be hanging out. And Beck is going to be taking you through. What are we going to be doing, Beck? Tell me. We're going to be doing one of my signature exercises for the Dare Darling coaching membership. And look, even if you don't join the Dare Darling membership, this is still going to change your life. This is going to be a not only a future vision setting space where we're not just setting goals that are our same old normal goals, but the point of this session is I want to expand your minds and have you think about greater possibilities for your life. Things that, you know, dare darlings in so many ways about, you know, the, the self-rejection that we do and the, the self-sabotage and the ways that we hold ourselves back, we unlock you from that. So this session is all about having you think bigger, think outside of what you think you're currently capable of. And then us, we're going to use some neuroscience backed techniques to have you actually increase your chances of achieving that goal, making that change and set you up with um, some more actionable, tangible steps to get started. So I'm hoping to expand your mind and also feed your mind with the things that it needs to actually get things done. It sounds like so much fun. So we will see you there. Um, and thank you so much for listening and we will see you again next week. <laughs> Bye. and up in